Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Managing Madrid podcast. It is Tuesday. It is special guest day. And boy, as far as special guests go, we have a really, really fun guest today that I've been looking forward to chatting with. And it's the first time ever making his Managing Madrid podcast debut, Adrian Sousa of Rabona TV. He has built an empire over on YouTube. And as he himself likes to put it, football explainers. And I love it because it goes in depth and actually educates people. It's away from hysteria, clout, and it's just very informative. Also very aesthetically pleasing, as you can see by his background right now. Some cool lights, a nice plant. I love it. Adrian, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And uh, yeah, try to keep it chill with the plant. I will say it is a fake plant. It used to be a real plant. That was an ongoing thing that I had with my channel for a while where... I get a plant, it would die. I get a new one, it would die. There was a lot of conspiracy theories. Is this the original plant or is this some fake sort of like the, you know, Paul McCartney conspiracy theories from back in the day? But yeah, we're uh we're happy to be on here. I mean, I've had some interactions with managing Madrid in the past. I had Lucas on the channel once to speak about Isco, and that was a great video. Really enjoyed doing that. So it's great to finally meet you. We've been sort of circling each other in the uh in the online football space for a while now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, we get, we always kind of like have this open hotline with our members and say, hey, do you guys suggest any podcast guests? Who do you want us to bring on? And, and your name often comes up. So um, it is, it's definitely cool to, to find the connect. I was telling you off air that I went on, on a bit of a binge on your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So I thought we could, we could start here from the beginning. Let's start from the beginning. And I, and I have to mention, you're also a fellow Canadian, which is Awesome, because we're getting more Canadians on the podcast. The more Canadians, the better. Um, so I love that aspect of it. When did you start? How did you start? First question before I get into that. Did you see the latest Canadian kits? No. The national team ones? Oh, I'm they're Google right now. They are controversial. Some people love them. Some people hate them. Some people think they look like old Tim Hortons uh coffee mugs but uh i don't know i'm split it, every time there's a nike kit drop or an adidas kit drop i find that i hate it at first and i learned to love it but anyways that's is it is it uh this one here i'm gonna share my screen yeah hit it this one those ones those are the ones uh, a little bit eh. don't love it don't love it it does feel a little bit circus or clown show with the white one. Oh my god yeah, Next see to the what Tim I'm saying? Wharton's Canada Cup is it just looks even worse. Yeah, it's you can't yeah. unsee that now. It's it's over for you. I'm a big fan of the the black ones we wore. Uh I think we even wore them in the World Cup, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, I um, agree with you. That for me, that's just the cleanest, nicest one. Uh we had some good results with that one as well, like the ice teca and everything like that. So we had some good I, memories. We we peaked as a nation in the World Cup qualifiers and then like probably half time of the Belgium game. Yeah, I agree. And that was the peak peak of Canada ever. Yeah. Apart from Sidney Crosby hitting the Olympics gold gold medal uh goal and uh the Toronto Raptors winning the 2019 championship, we've peaked as Canadians at at, at, at half time against Belgium where we're all like, "Oh my god, Canada, look out." Remember there was like people like talking about us as if we're like the dark horse horse for the World Cup all of a sudden cuz we dominated belgium and lost yeah i uh i remember prior to the world cup um leboeuf from espn saying that canada could go all the way to like the semis or something like that which is just <laughs> just just nonsense of course i mean fun to listen to but i mean canada making it all that far i don't know about that we were in a group with morocco croatia and belgium like let's we had great qualifying but let's yeah. just be real here you know we were vindicated by how far our group actually went. So that 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 felt nice to see Morocco go all the way and yeah and make us look a little bit better. But I don't it's not it's not, not looking as good right now. No, but it's it's not. We're not here to talk about Canada as much as you and I could do that forever. <laughs> uh all right. So yeah, I interrupted you. You you were telling me how you started and when you started. That was that was my bad. I derailed it completely. But yeah, how I started is I was always sort of interested in YouTube. I used I was a big YouTube watcher. And then out of university, I got a job at this other big YouTube channel called Watch Mojo, 
where I was a video editor and I was a researcher and writer and I did sort of everything essentially. Um, and coupling that with what I was learning at the channel and what I was learning in school, I, uh, cause I went to school for broadcast journalism. I sort of coupled that with what my passion was, which was, you know, watching football and talking about it. And I didn't have a ton of people to talk about it with it being in Canada. You know, it's not, it wasn't the most common thing, depending, you know, you can find your communities of people where they'll talk about it, but it's not as common as someone speaking about, you know, the NHL or basketball or even baseball in certain cities. Right. So I started getting a little bit of traction on YouTube. And by that, I mean, <laughs> I was getting maybe like 30 subscribers or something like that. And I was able to get the attention of Jimmy Conrad, who a lot of people probably remember from Kick TV, former men's national team player for the USA. And I started collaborating with him and just doing these like Friday afternoon things where I would give a prediction for a weekend game. And I just sort of went from there. Um, but I found that my niche was sort of just the thing that I was the most interested in, which was sort of where football and history or culture sort of all meet together and how they sort of blend. And one of my biggest series that sort of blossomed on my channel was called Roots of the Rivalry, where I go over, you know, basically the biggest rivalries in the sport and what's at the very root of them. Not just, well, it's because the fans hate each other. It's let's look at the foundational history of the two clubs and see if there is a split like there is in the case of AC Milan and Inter Milan or if there's a, a, a religious divide or anything like that, you know, and that series started to do well. And that's where I sort of settled into my explainer guy looks at history, you know, sometimes I'll do an old video, like we may talk about like Thomas Gravison out of nowhere in 2024, that kind of thing. So. I'm going to ask you about that. I watched that video today, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, I like just telling random stories, looking into the history of things, understanding it from a cultural perspective. Um, and I think that's sort of where I've settled in. Yeah. So you have, I mean, and that, that story hits home, like mm. growing up in Canada, no one to really talk to about it, you know, basically just the whole community and, and realm, the dialogue I had was online, right? Message yeah. boards um, and eventually getting into this and connecting. The internet made it easy to connect with like-minded people. But yeah, growing up, it was not easy in the 90s if you loved Real Madrid or European football. But you have Portuguese roots, right? Yes, I do. Yeah. Do you have... So I... This is probably has something to do with how good you are at being neutral because I couldn't really tell but do you have an allegiance to any team apart from the Portuguese national team club or country I do so uh Benfica and I've done a few videos on Benfica in the past I uh <laughs> unfortunately the ones that do the best are ones where I'm sort of you know taking a super super deep look at our past president who was arrested on money laundering, et cetera, and stuff like that. And sort yeah. of the issues that have been caused because of that. Um, and other times when like George Jesus was sacked from Benfica and how that happened, blah, blah, blah. Because I find that every single time I do a positive video on Benfica, they start to go on a terrible run. So now I'm, I'm scared. I'm shot shy now. I don't want to do anything to celebrate Benfica too much because I have been blamed by uh, some people in the fan base now and then. But yeah, Benfica is the club that I have an allegiance to, but I don't try to show it too often. You probably see it more on Twitter than you do on my YouTube channel. Got it. So no, no Real Madrid connection, even with the Portuguese renaissance with Pepe and Carvalho and Cristiano Coentrao. I think that anyone who, I mean, in Portugal and then especially in North America, any uh, sort of the expats that are living in North America, I think anyone who was following the sport at that time or, or even maybe got into the sport because of it. But with Cristiano Ronaldo, you sort of followed him wherever he went because yeah. it was this player that was, first of all, like sort of a phenom at Manchester United because of how rapid he was and his style of play. And he started to get that sort of Beckham association with, you know, good looking guy, looks like a little bit of a player, what have you. But then he just got better and better. Then he wins the Ballon d'Or. Then he's going to Real Madrid. And it's like, are we going to have one of the greatest players of all time on our hands? Which it turns out that we did. And so I think naturally anyone who is of a Portuguese descent or Portuguese themselves was sort of following his career. So yeah, I would say, especially when you get Mourinho there, Carvalho was there for a while, Pepe, of course, who's a, a living legend to this day in the game. Um, I would say that I followed him sort of everywhere he went, but it's not that I would 
say that I'm a Real Madrid supporter or anything like that. I don't I don't really have any association with either side, really. Well, I guess now that I think about it, I mean, none of those guys are Benfica guys, right? Sporting, no. Porto. You I had Cohen Traum. You Trang got the worst sporting, of us. Right? No, he's Benfica. And then he's he went Benfica? back. Yeah, then he went back to sporting. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, he had a minute where he was decent for you guys, no? Uh, Co- Cohen Trow has a cult following, and I am the leader yeah? of it. I absolutely really? love this guy. Yeah, I don't know what it is about him. I mean, he was... When he was healthy, he was awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know, like he off, like Mourinho would do the thing where he, if he needed defense in a big game, he would go with Cohen Trout mm. and instead of Marcelo for tactical reasons. And for that reason, he kind of got the moniker of a guy who's more defensive. But then you would watch him with the Portuguese national team, and he would be so amazing offensively. He just wasn't allowed that same kind of freedom necessarily with Real Madrid when he yeah. played. But most famously, he pocketed Arthur Robin in the Champions League uh, semifinals against Bayern, and, and that was huge. So I love him, and I just I think it's just his personality. He's kind of like aloof, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's that famous scene where he's sitting on the bench at Real Madrid, and I don't know if you've seen it. When Casillas is like, "Hey, dude, you're not in the squad today. You shouldn't be here," and they like kick him out, and he's like, <laughs> "Has no idea what's going on. He has to go to the stands." Just like a funny aloof guy that's like kind of fun to root for, I guess. Yeah, um, he, uh, he sort of kept up that reputation going back to Portugal, but almost in like a, uh, I guess you're putting it nicely with the sort of aloof kind of thing, because he just sort of seemed like a silly kind of airhead <laughs> when he came back to Portugal. There was a lot of sort of laughing at his expense when he yeah. came back to Portugal kind of thing. Yeah, um, I don't know. I always felt bad for him, too, with all the injuries. Um, yeah. But speaking of aloof, uh, Thomas Gravison, <laughs> I, I watched that video today. <laughs> Brought back some crazy memories. So I don't like, so Matt, who's on the Managing Winter podcast, something that we like to do, like if it's slow news day or it's the international break or it's the summer, sometimes we like just go back and do historical podcasts when there's no games to cover. Mm. And um, we like to kind of play this game because we both feel that Real Madrid right now are as smart as they've ever been. And are starting to avoid the mistakes that you they like Florentino used to make like 20 years ago, right? And we like to think like, would Real Madrid have signed this guy now? You know, you think back to Gravison, 29 years old when we signed him. I don't know. The scattering report on this character is a little bit dodgy. Like, you know, is he fit with the character guys, the young profile of Jude Bellingham, Eduardo Camavinga, kids with good heads on their shoulders, supremely talented, can do a bit of everything. What do you think? Like, would would they have signed someone like him now? I think if they're in a desperate situation, which it seems like they were based on the research I was doing and looking back in time, yeah, they sort of needed someone to fill that hole because you're still hurting from losing Makaleli at what 18 months prior or something like yeah. that. Um, and you look at the options that you had in midfield at that time, you needed a little bit of you know, tough tackling, a little bit of steel, someone to give some cover to the back line. I think that in any other situation. No, I can't see Thomas Grafson being signed by this Real Madrid. I mean, you look at the signings that Real Madrid are making these days, and it just doesn't fit at all. Yeah. Um, so, no, I don't think that they would go for him these days. But I do think that, and maybe you can, you can definitely speak to this better than I can, as someone who watched him game in, game out. I think that he was, I think everything that he does, like his crazy antics, like if you look at any training photos of Gravison at Real Madrid, he's throwing Ronaldo, R9 Ronaldo on the floor. He's throwing Roberto Carlos on the floor. He's like wrestling Figo. Like he's just a nut. Yeah. And I think that overshadowed his overall gameplay as well. Because in that Premier League season, he was actually quite good for Everton from everything that I could read. You know, Everton supporters hold him near and dear to their hearts for how good he was, not just because he's a funny character, but he was actually good on the pitch for them. So yeah. how was he at Real? It's an interesting because, like, so if I put myself in a time machine, uh, I remember again, like going back to message boards and that back then I was like, you know. 15 maybe yeah and there was a lot of danish people who were speaking highly about him like you guys are you guys got a great player under the radar i mean you mentioned in your video that the two teams that were scouting him were ac milan and real madrid mm-hmm. and at that time the, arguably the two best teams in the world right milan at that time was a powerhouse so like the fact that that's the company of the two teams that are scouting you is it's got to be indicative of something um I don't think he lived up to it at Real Madrid and you already outlined the reasons in your video why. I think like 
there was a bit of a desperation, as you put it back then, because we had just lost McAuley. If it were me, and this is an underrated mistake, like the 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 headline mistake is that we sold McAuley. The more underrated mistake, I think, was also that we had a Siban Cambiaso in the squad that could have taken the mantle. And we didn't trust him as much. And he went to Inter and became a trouble winner, right? I think he would have been a great some great guy to take the the DM role um post Makaleli, but <clears throat> he was just he was just kind of all over the place, man. Um and you know, fist fighting with Robinho in training. Like he was unhinged, but not in like the kind of good Rudiger way. Yeah. More of like Rudiger's like smart, intelligent, unhinged, you know. Casemiro was like he's just there to like just run around and uh wasn't a huge fan. Wasn't a huge fan to be honest. I hope for more, but it wasn't. Yeah, he uh I think that <laughs> everywhere he goes, you hear about all these crazy stories and how liked he is by the fans and even his squad mates, for example. But it just was like a world colliding moment with that kind of player at Real Madrid towards the sort of tail end, I guess, of the Galacticos era, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just didn't really make sense. Well, it's funny, like, do we, that that team was so top-heavy and obviously, like, the, the label of the Galacticos is that they would sign the superstars and not the guys that you need to balance it out. They tried. I mean, they signed Gravison. They, tr- they signed um, Pablo Garcia. They signed, you know, you mentioned Woodgate, I think, briefly in the video. But none of these guys really worked out. And I think the scouting department is stronger now to kind of find those those guys to get at a cheaper cheaper price. Um, we have some questions that came in for you specifically. Okay. We also have a super chat that just rolled in. Maybe we'll start with the super chat. This one's interesting. Brings us to the current Real Madrid squad. Parnav Jadhav says, Adrian, who are your top three players for Real Madrid right now destined to be best in the world, not including hmm. Vinicius and Jude. Not including. Okay. Um, I'm a big Shuameni guy, personally. I love him, and I think that he's shown... Again, I don't watch every single Real Madrid game, so you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I've seen of him at center back as well, showing that he can just rotate into that position so easily and be a top center back from what I've seen at least in that position is quite impressive. And at such a young age. Um, and then, okay, two more, two more. Um, Jude is out. <laughs> we can't do Jude. So we have Shuamani. There's Kamavinga. Kamavinga is also impressive with how he's been all over the place. Um, that's tough. I th- so Shuamani's definitely in there. You got me, Pranav. You got me. Shuamani's definitely in there. I think, and he hasn't shown it yet, but I think that Arda Guler, I see something in him. I know that that's sort of a outside shot because we haven't seen much of him at Real Madrid yet. But when you look at how good he is, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit later, I think that he definitely has a shot to be a world beater. So I'll put him as sort of like a substitute right now if I can't think of anyone else. Um, Fede Valverde, uh, sort of up and down a little bit. I think it's, or maybe it's just his role change. It makes it feel like he's been up and down. And basically, uh, I, but I think that he's shown over the past few years that Fede Valverde is one of the top, top players at Real Madrid. So I'll put him in there. We got Shuameni. And I like, I, I think it's an easy one, but I think I'm going to have to go with Kamavinga as well. Um, Kamavinga, you know, just his whole story, his family coming from Angola, going to France at such a young age, he goes to Real Madrid. They had to sort of get the rash tackles out of him. Maybe he still has one now and then. He loves a flying sliding tackle. Um, But I think that Kamavinga has shown just his overall intelligence to be able to slot in at left back, which I don't think anyone really expected him to do so well. From central midfield, he can go forward a little bit. So I think that Kamavinga, Shuameni, and uh, Fede Valverde are the guys that I would sort of place right now. There's no wrong answers. I mean, as long as you stick within the short list of really great young players that we have moving forward, I think, you know, now we wait and see, like, who has the highest ceiling, who's yeah. going to make, like, I guess the, the the question is essentially to me, outside of Vinny and Jude, who has the highest ceiling to be, like, a Ballon d'Or podium kind of player? 
in yeah. this team. Um, you mentioned Goulet. Why don't we talk about him now? You had sure. a video on him, scouting him. What did you, what did you find on him in terms of how he plays, what his ceiling is, and then we can talk about like what's next with like the million players that Real Madrid have, and, and in terms of how likely he is to kind of crack the crack the eleven in the rotation. So I think that he's sort of in an unfortunate position right now. Just his current situation. I'll go back to his beginnings in a bit. Um, yeah. His current situation seems like he came back from that big injury, which was just a horrible way to start at Real Madrid. Uh, after all that promise in preseason, he was looking so good, etc. Everyone saw those training videos and everything where he looked so comfortable amongst his peers. And then he gets that big injury and he doesn't really come back until what was it, end of December, early January or so, that sort yeah. of area. Yeah. Um, there were and a few that, relapses. Every time we thought yeah. he was coming back, it would get pushed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And when you're sort of dealing with something like that at a young age, at a new club, the club's in mid-season, right? They, Carlo Ancelotti's got to get results at this point. There's not really that beginning part of the season where, like, I like to look at it like how Pep Guardiola does it at Man City, just as an example. He gets these new signings. He gives them a lot of playing time at the beginning of the season. He sees how they are, and then they sort of establish their place, or they don't for later in the season. I mean, I yeah. guess that's what every manager kind of does. And so he kind of missed out on that. And coming in midseason, it's a little bit more difficult. But I think, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I have seen, every time he's come on, he's shown you something. There's yes. been little flashes. There's been looks. There's been a goal now and then. He'll rip one off the post. He'll show a little shimmy that he gets around two, three players and then plays a nice pass. So there, you at least are seeing something from him. And I think that now that you're getting into the business end of the season, it's a little bit more difficult for Carlo Ancelotti to just throw him in there in these big matches, um, where it, which is unfortunate for him. But next season, if he does start to get those minutes, I think that he can really establish himself. And what I liked it, of him from such a young age was that, and I always mess up the name of his first club. I, I can't pronounce Turkish names. I'm sorry, but I think it's Gençler Bili. Sure. Something like that. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> to <don't> Fenerbahce. <laughs> he, uh, he just always showed that he was never really overwhelmed by any situation that he was put in, even from a super young age, you know, Alex D'Souza was his idol. He got to play net here. It got to sort of like meet him and, practice with him then he was with Ozil who was another idol of his he was got to play with him and he was never overtaken by sort of the pressure cooker that is Turkish football as you guys probably saw this past weekend it's just it's wild out there um and I think that there's a lot of Fenerbahce supporters that sort of look to him in that George Jesus season where they didn't win and they think if George Jesus had actually trusted him a little bit more Arda Guler was playing at such a high level that he could have potentially helped them win the season. He could have been that difference maker for them. But George Jesus is also the dude that played Bernardo Silva at left back at Benfica. So there's no surprise there. He has no trust in young players. Um, but yeah, I think that sort of the through line on everything with Arda Guler that impresses me beyond just his ability on the ball and how he kind of actually, funnily enough, reminds me of Bernardo Silva a little bit left-footed player on the right half space, you know, cutting inside, very technically gifted. The thing that has impressed me the most has been, even if you look at his Real Madrid unveiling, it's his mom who's crying and he's comforting her kind of thing, you know? Like, he's not overwhelmed at all. He just seems singularly focused. Like, he has this sort of elite mentality to go with all of that ability as well, which I think is something that is rare with a lot of these guys because you can see these young players that are, you know, slaloming through the other U16s and scoring ridiculous amounts of goals. But if they don't have the mental side of it, probably don't have a shot of making it, right? And I think that he has that. And so that's why I have so much belief in Guler. I'm part of the, uh, you know, Guler fan club for sure. He, he, Everybody loves him. I mean, not least the Turkish fan base, which is incredible, incredibly supportive. I'll put it that way. Uh, but like he's just like a lovable figure. There's a humility and quietness to him that I think fans appreciate and like. It's amazing because so I, I'll just throw this at you. If you mm -hmm. had to guess how many, unless you've looked it up before the podcast, in that case, well then 
you know, it's not as fun. But if you had to guess how many minutes Goulier has played this season without looking it up in La Liga, what would how many minutes would you say? In La Liga? Yeah. Um like I mean he's I know he played in Copa del Rey. Yeah. Uh I would say I feel like I've barely seen the guy. Like 30? 36 minutes. 36, okay. And you mentioned like, you know, in those limited minutes, he's been impactful. In 36 minutes of La Liga this season, he has five shot creating actions. He has a goal. Not listed in that is that he hit the crossbar from halfway uh, a couple days ago against Osasuna in like the 90th minute. And he nearly scored off the bench uh, before that. I don't know if it was Girona. I can't remember in like two, three minutes on the field. So like he's coming in at minute 87, like, and he, you see him, he's doing shit. Like somehow, like in limited, like you could, you've seen Adrian, like there's players who could play every game and Mm -hmm. you don't even know if they're on the field. This guy in just limited. Now, mind you, the game state is different when he comes in. It's usually in a situation where the game is dusted. There's more space. There's less pressure. Sure. But you know, you notice him, and I think everyone's just kind of like crying and like itching for more because they want to see more. And then we see all these training clips of him, you know, not making players and doing roulettes and having these visionary passes. We want to see more. So um, now the question is, how do you get him in? Yeah. Right. Um, I think in many ways, Adrian, in terms of luck of timing, Brahim was lucky where Arda wasn't. Because Brahim wasn't really trusted by Carlo Ancelotti much either. But because of injuries, he had to keep playing him. And every time he played, Brahim was awesome. So now Guler is in a situation, now he's back. It's hard for him because even if he proves himself, there are like four established players ahead of him. And and that's what makes it challenging. So I, I don't know. I don't know how he fits, but it's, it's a question we all kind of have. Um, I, and I, I have it as well. Sorry to cut you off, but I no, have it as well it. because when I think of Real Madrid and all of the positions on the pitch, I feel like that that right side isn't necessarily the position where you think, okay, we already have our guy who's number one on the team sheet. He's unmovable there. But I, I mean, I could be wrong, right? Or is there someone who, is it just a lack of trust in Guler because he's so young? So that's why Rodrigo is getting it or what have you. I think it's, I don't know if it's so much of a lack of trust more than uh, the established players ahead of him. Right. And like Rodrigo, who hasn't been very good this season, he's not in, he's been streaky. He's had a patch of good form, but then a couple of patches where he's not contributing much offensively, but he has an established trust in the hierarchy, right? That it's hard to leapfrog that. And, you know, like, he can Goulart can play in different roles. Like he can play in a deeper role in a midfield kind of role, right? Central midfield. But you know, you have Fede there. Then you have a million midfielders that you have to squeeze in. And I think that's part of the issue. And also you mentioned this, like now we're heading into the apex of the season where the margin of error is less and less. So like, are you going to trust him against city for two legs? I mean, it doesn't matter what we say. Will Carlo trust him against city over two legs? I don't, you know, it's hard to see that. So now I think he's being introduced more in less pressure situations um, is a reality. Do you want some um, breaking breaking news? Yeah, hit me. So Real Madrid's training session is uh, today and uh, Courtois has suffered a, a major m- meniscus injury in the other knee. Apparently. No way. Yeah, devastating. Wow. Like so, we're talking like another eight month layoff kind of injury, like that bad. I have no idea. I mean, I you know, it's literally just looking at Twitter right now, according to Marca, and um, like not even a relapse of his injury, the other knee. Yeah, that's yeah. brutal. That's really, really brutal. I mean, I know that that's always a possibility because of you know that injury re injury cycle that players go through when you have a major injury like that, then you start you know favoring the other leg slightly and your form goes off a little bit, but. To blow the other knee so because he just got back into training didn't he like a week as of a week ago or so that's right i mean he's been actually back in training for like a month doing light things like work and stuff but carlo ancelotti had said like he's going to be back for the city game which everyone was like whoa yeah like that's sooner than we thought and like andre lunen's playing amazing so like is this really urgent to rush him back but now it's uh 
now it's um uh, i mean that's devastating yeah that's terrible he uh i was amazed to hear that he was even back in training because i remember back in it might have even been as recently as december or november he said that he sort of ruled himself out for the euros for belgium like there's yes. no shot i'm gonna make it and then yeah. to hear Carlos say we could have him for City is nuts, but uh, that's a shame. I feel for the guy. That's tough for the uh, for the old mental. That's I mean that's it's devastating. And he's he's what thirty? He's thirty one now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't know. That's that's horrible. I, I don't even know what to say. Uh, get well soon, Tebow man. That's that's devastating news. I'm sure we'll have more news later on the podcast or tomorrow when we uh when we see what actually happens um all right let's get back to some good news so i have prepared by prepared i mean just a very simple task of putting together questions sent in by our patrons so our members um especially our guaranteed members they get guaranteed responses to their questions and there's some good ones here so I'm gonna bring this up. Hold on, let me in real time just juggle this uh, Streamyard thing. Get rid of, uh, get rid of this for one second. All right. So Ananya Kumar says, Adrian, big fan. Adrian, along with uh, Filippo, made an absolutely brilliant video on Endrick before Real Madrid signed him. Especially loved the part where they talked about Endrick's personality and his struggles growing up. Would love to know what Adrian has made of Endrick's progression in the last year and a half. Also, how would he fit in the current Real Madrid setup and his overall ceiling as a player? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that. Yeah, Filippo, shout out to Filippo. He's uh, he's a friend of mine. He's another YouTuber, Tactical Manager TV, but he is also a lifetime, lifelong Palmeiras fan. So if ever you uh, sign another Palmeiras player, maybe if you go after Estevang or whoever in the future, be sure to hit him up. Nope. Um, but yeah, he... Now, I will be honest, I haven't been following him super, super closely in the last year and a half, but from talking with Filippo, I sort of keep up on his progression. And I know that Palmeiras went sort of... They ended up winning the league last season in 2023, but I know that they went through a little bit of a difficult moment. So Endrick wasn't getting as much as maybe people sort of hoped he would get as far as playing time goes they wanted him to be that number one on the team sheet kind of guy playing match in match out but i overall considering i mean we forget that he's only 17 like he hasn't even turned 18 yet because we've been hearing about him for so long at this point it feels like that we forget how old he actually is so i think that his progression overall as a 17 year old if you look at it for what it is has been good um, as far as where I see him fitting in with Real Madrid, I think that he has all these attributes. Like a lot of people think of, you know, he's a strong left-footed player, so he's Adriano, but that's not really the case. He's a guy that can sort of get on the ball and offer a lot more than just being that fox in the box or the finisher or that physical presence in the box. He can drop a little bit deeper, spray passes around, sort of link up play a little bit. Um, so I think that he would be that sort of striker that, and I don't want to compare him to um oh my god my brain benzema mm -hmm. but i would say that he does offer things that are closer to benzema than they are to like a Joselu, for example where he can drop down and he can control the ball and he can get in physical duels with players and sort of win the ball and then play in his wingers or what have you um so i think that he would be a nice option for Carlo Ancelotti. And didn't Ancelotti even say that, like, no, no, Endrick will get minutes with us next season. Like, he will be played. Did he not say that? Uh, he, now all the press conferences are blurry to me, but <laughs> I that, that does sound vaguely correct. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's correct. I, I think, no, I, okay, now it's coming to me. I think he said something like, Endrick is coming to be our player next year. Because I think there was some theorizing of like, is he actually coming over or is he going out on loan? Right. Is he going to be in the youth team like Pascal? He's like, no, he's going to be part of the squad. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that if he is given those minutes, look, he's still a he's still a 17-year-old at the moment. Yeah. So he's not going to look like the sort of finished product. And yeah. I know that some people, there's probably a lot of like trolls from opposing you know teams etc that are saying this but they like to look at his numbers and say oh well they aren't that great you know they paid all this money for this but if you look at the numbers of any player like look at vinicius for example yeah, when Vinny he was that age Rodrigo were the same. 
exactly their numbers were similar because they're developing they haven't even hit their 18th birthday yet just with patience i think that endrick is that sort of special player and like i went over in the video and similar to guler actually sort of the through line between the two is the mentality sides of things and the maturity side of things and this is something that filippo brought up and you know as a brazilian he was saying we've had a lot of sort of guys that have come through with tons of talent over the years but never had the personality or the professionalism to sort of reach the heights that they've promised to at such a young age and with endrick it just seems like he's already a 28 year old man as far as his mentality goes and his maturity level um and part of that is from going through poverty and having to help his family put food on the table and everything like that so he's taken on a lot at a young age he's lived a life that lived many lives already compared to what we have to in North America as an example. And I think that he uh, he has that mentality and with patience, the ability and everything will sort of fuse together. And like you've seen at Real Madrid with these young players, these signings have been pretty all hits, no misses. Maybe Rainier is one that has been a bit of a miss, but yeah, it's been all all hits, no misses for the most part with these young guys, if you give them time. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, no team in sports history ever is has a 100% track record with player development and signings and stuff but it's been about as good as it gets in the last few years for Real Madrid but you know with regards to numbers too i often say like when you're signing when you're scouting someone in brazil or uruguay or wherever at that age you're not looking at numbers and analytics really you're just using your eye test to look at the upside because even if you did have some kind of analytical scouting report and, you know, the amount of goals and assists over a small sample size in Brazil, it doesn't really mean anything anyway. You're just basically trusting your judgment. So like when Juni Calafa, the Real Madrid scout who goes to Brazil and South America and elsewhere, he's not looking at data. He's looking at like this guy is going to be something or not, you know. So, you know, numbers only, you know, I think would take you so far in that discussion. <clears throat> yeah. So, here are, let me see. Um, Tapiwa Musa has a couple questions. I think you may have already answered the first one, so you don't have to touch on it unless you, you wanted to fill in some gaps you didn't earlier. He says, what inspired him to combine this passion for football with creating content on YouTube? And the second question is, can Adrian tell us about a memorable experience or moment he's had while covering football? And this could be whatever... Uh, be it a milestone related or people he's met or games he's had the pleasure to go to, etc. Um, yeah, so I think we did sort of go over. First of all, shout out Taps. He's a he's a subscriber of mine as well. Awesome. So it's he's a, a great guy. He's a One really of the most really positive good guy. people ever. Yeah, he's amazing. He's super supportive. So shout out Taps. He's a great guy. Um, as far as yeah, the passion and everything, sort of merging my passion with football coverage is simply that. Uh, I, I had a passion for YouTube and football and, uh, I wanted to sort of fuse the two and give a good shot at it and not live with any regrets of, Oh, I, sh I should have gone for that. I wish I had kind of thing. Um, as far as memorable moments go, I would say that the first one that pops in my mind is back in 2019 when, um, my channel was a lot smaller at that time. It was like under a hundred thousand subscribers and, uh, I got an opportunity to finally see Benfica play for the first time in my life, which mm. was really, really cool. So it was it was during their preseason tour, but I got sent down to San Jose to go see them play against Chivas. You know, not the big matchup you want to see, but still, it was it was great. In fact, the Chivas supporters were incredible. So it was really, really fun to see them together. Um, but yeah, I would say that that's the most memorable was just having that pitch side access and being able to sort of stand behind the goal as they're playing and seeing the players warm up and everything. Um, professionally, I would say another one that comes to mind would have to be that 2022 World Cup, which wasn't really anything massive for my channel, but doing watch alongs and having people from all over the world come in. I had watch alongs that were hitting over 10,000 people viewing, which is not the norm in the slightest at all on my channel. Typically when I do a watch along, if I get two to 300 people, I'm happy. That kind of Wait, thing. What was the number that you said? I think it was over 10 or 12,000 at one point. That's amazing. Like if I go back and I look at that watch along views wise, it's over a million. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it final number was. I have a screenshot somewhere, but that was 
that felt like a really cool moment. And obviously that wasn't because of anything I did. That was because of the World Cup itself and how that went to a shootout and it's Mbappe and it's Messi and everything like that. So it wasn't on me, but it was still a cool moment to sort of have this like a bunch of people watching and just feeling like you're in the pocket a little bit. You know, you sort of get that like even I'm sure yourself, sometimes when you're doing a podcast, it just feels like you're going through the motions and yes. you're kind of struggling to string sentences together. But then there's <laughs> other times where you're you're in that pocket and everything's flowing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I felt like I was a, a seasoned commentator watching that game with everyone. So it was a it was a memorable moment for sure. So can I can I ask you to expand on that? Because so when I was on your YouTube channel today, I noticed that, that there was a two hour live stream from the Manchester City Real Madrid Champions League tie last year. Yeah. And uh, I'll admit I did not go and watch that two-hour video before we hit the record button. But I was very curious to like, because people have been asking us to do it. And I'm like, I can't because I'm working during Real Madrid games. So yeah. if I have to do it, it would probably be for like another team. Maybe even during the Euros, maybe we'll do something. I don't know. Or like, you know, if maybe Barca PSG coming up. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but how do you like, do you have challenges like filling in the gaps? Cause like it's a long time to stream for that long. It is just it watching is. a game. Like, you know, like, so do you feel pressure to constantly have to talk while you're watching the game to kind of commentate on Like, how does that work? It's sort of a muscle that you build like with anything. Right. Um, so it was something that like, I was never really good at talking, <laughs> never very talented at speaking in these sort of, in these sort of sets up even like I wasn't good at interviewing people. I wasn't good at just holding a conversation when people would ask me questions. So I used watch alongs in the past as sort of like a way to build that muscle to sort of feel like, you know, I have to speak. I'm forced into it. I'm and it helps because you're reacting to something live. So there's always something you can look at. You can always pull up some stats. And then there's also the chat as well, which is a huge thing for filling in gaps because people are asking you questions all the time. People are giving their thoughts on the match all the time. So I think that it would be, uh, you'd be fine. <laughs> Honestly, you'd have enough people in there. I encourage you to try it because it's enjoyable. Like don't put a lot of pressure on it. Um, just have like a very basic setup like I do. Maybe some stats on screen, that kind of thing. People just mm -hmm. want to see the score and hang out with you because ultimately they're watching the game themselves. Some people aren't, but a lot of people are. Yeah. And like us as kids who had no one to talk to, a lot of these people don't have anyone to watch a match with. So there you are. You're the person they're hanging out with. I guess it's worth a shot at some point. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like we started this podcast, like very kind of just podcast strict audio. Like YouTube was never really on the radar. It's like you, you upload on Spotify, you upload on Apple or whatever. And it's an audio thing. People listen to it in the car, but now it's like the whole, we've just kind of like dove into the YouTube thing in part because other creators like you have told us like, dude get on youtube you're you're wasting time right now like it's great that you have that you know spotify apple but you got to get on youtube and like i'm glad we did and now the live thing was kind of a new venture for us too maybe the next step will we, will we watch along i'm not sure um we're gonna get a couple more questions in i i did you did we get the tap thing oh yeah you, you kind yeah, of spoke yeah. about the world cup like was there anything else you wanted to add to this um memorable experience or moment he's had um I mean, I think I covered them. I mean, I'm sure there's other ones that I'm not thinking of in the moment, but yeah, I think that's, I think those two are the big ones. Seeing Benfica and, uh, and the World Cup was really fun. Uh, Howard Moore says, hi there, Adrian. I hope this message question finds you well in good health, spiritually, emotionally, but more importantly, mentally. I have a couple questions. Firstly, in your opinion, with today's analytics, data, and other information at our disposal, how would they have helped the players um, and footballers of 30 to 40 years ago? Lastly, in your opinion, what's more defining players with really good tactics or a very good manager with average football players? Whew, that's a tough one. Um, I guess as far as optimizing performance go, I think that analytics would have helped a lot of players back then. I mean, I guess it's no really not really different to how it helps them now right? They would be able to identify areas where they're weak and uh, try to sort of reverse those things. Um, 
It would have been interesting though, wouldn't it? And I assume he's talking about analytics as far as like expected goals and those kind of things and not really like performance, like sports science kind of thing, right? He's, or maybe he is. I, I don't think know. so, but it could, it could be both, I guess, for the sake of the discussion. Yeah. I think that if you go back 30, 40 years, if, as far as like the sports science type of thing, you know, you always hear stories about players smoking in dressing rooms and, yeah. you know, the drinking culture and everything yeah. like that. So I think that it would have just elevated football at a more rapid rate, I guess, to a point where they would have those best practices already in there at that time. And who knows what football would look like now, you know, mm -hmm. um, as far as the analytics and sort of analyzing the game, it's, I don't know. I'm not the biggest, I don't know about you. I'm not the biggest like expected goals and non-penalty X, blah, 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 blah. I get very surface level with all of that. I use it sort of as a guide to the eye test uh, more mm -hmm. so than like, I'm trying to dig and find the next gem out of the third tier of the Romanian football league kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm not too deep in that. Um, and the other question was, what was the other one? Uh, What's more defining players with really good tactics or a or a very good manager with average football players? So basically it's kind of like, hmm. I don't know, I would, versus coach kind of thing. Yeah. And I think that it's an interesting one, but I think that I would honestly, t I think that a good manager can sort of make anyone serviceable. And uh, that only goes to a certain point, right? When you're, you know, like, let's say you have a bunch of nobodies on a team that are playing under a, Simone Inzaghi, for example, he can do really great things and he can improve all of those players to a certain point. But then you get to at the elite level, that's where the players make a difference. Yeah. You know, I think that the manager's influence can only go so far until you come up against someone who is has that same sort of managerial um, aptitude, I guess. <laughs> and uh, but also the players to sort of back it up as well. So I think that I personally like someone like you know let's go with Simone Inzaghi mm -hmm. you look at some of the signings that he's had to make over the years and how he's still been able to improve Inter time and time again yes they they shit the bed against Atleti um, but beyond that he's had to bring in signings like Alexis Sanchez again mm -hmm. Arnautovic in 2023-24 um, even with guys like Matteo Darmian, who he got from Parma I believe it was a couple of years ago look what he's done with Darmian look what he's done with a Cherby from Lazio, that kind of thing. So he puts these systems into place and the team you can see overall continues to improve. But it gets to that point where when you go up against a Manchester City, it's that's the difference. You have Lukaku blocking his own player shots and that kind of thing. Whereas you have Rodri, a midfielder who's scoring goals for Manchester City and being the ultimate difference maker in the end. I suppose it's it also like a case to case basis and depends on the club and thing like, cause this, this conversation often comes up, like what's more important, like talent or coach and tactics. And obviously both are important. I, I think ultimately like what's most important is like, are your players talent talented and at the highest level who are like the transcendent superstars that would transcend tactics and, and all that stuff. Like what would, as you said, coaches can only take it so far. And it really depends on the club because obviously there's an inverse truth to that in that we saw it with Mourinho and Porto, right? Mm. I don't think any other coach is winning the Champions League with that team that year. Mind you, you had a bit of a luck along the way with who you had to play in the final and all this, but, you know, it's, it's, it's there. Whereas, like, someone like Ancelotti, like, when he was coaching Everton and you stack that up against who's coaching Real Madrid, he's going to just be wildly more successful with more superstars because he, his style is nurturing and massaging egos, making sure everyone is getting along and just letting like his most famous quote to me that I love is who someone asked him, like, what advice do you give to Luka Modric? And he's like, he's Luka Modric. I, why would I tell him anything? He's like the, one of the greatest players ever. I'm not going to tell him what to do. He's going to decide what to do on the field, right? So it's a different style. Um, whereas Rafa Benitez, his predecessor, told said Luka Modric should never use the outside of his boot to make a pass, right? Um, who do you think is like, just going back to the question of analytics and sports science 30 to 40 years ago, who's the player you can think of back in that era that like, man, if we just gave this guy 
good sports science, good nutrition, good data, he would have been so much better than he was. Is there anyone you can think of? 30 to 40 years ago, that's tough for me. Um, mm. 30 to 40 years ago. I, I mean- We could simplify what, it. It could just be whoever you grew up watching. I would say, I mean, someone that comes to mind as like a what could have been, who was, you know, just had all the wrong influences is uh, Paul Gascoigne. You know, mm -hmm. that's a player that in the mid nineties, I, I mean, from what I've seen from looking back on sort of historical footage was an incredible player, but just was re led down the wrong path. Um, someone who I also like, who was ruined by injuries. Um, it's actually a current player. If that's <laughs> that now I'm completely cheating. <laughs> Renato Sanchez. Um, uh -huh. That's someone who I think is a name almost... I haven't heard in a long time. Exactly, man. He left Benfica at 18 after, you know, winning Euro 2016 with Portugal, goes to Bayern and it just all goes downhill. And he ends up at Swansea, ends up all over the place. He was at Lille, who, where he did fairly well. He was at PSG. Now he's at AS Roma. And again, it's just injury upon injury upon injury. It's like a never ending cycle of hell for him, unfortunately. So I, I wish that current science was strong enough to save his career. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like, you know, even even players who were great, like I'm thinking of even Ronaldo Nazario, and, and uh -huh. like like there's a whole injury thing. Like I'm sure, like it would have been hard to prevent what happened to him, but like in the Galactico era, those guys were drinking every day, mm -hmm. in the morning, at lunchtime, in the evening. Like they they're all on record saying this. Like they like Luxembourgo tried to come in and ban alcohol, and they were like, no, we actually drink after every practice, and we don't like to train too early. We like to sleep in. Cause we're out partying the night before like like that stuff probably wouldn't be allowed today and you just mm -hmm. wonder like how much better would they have been with just something more strict you know um begs I the question yeah. i remember when i was doing the gravison video actually i was reading some old like capello uh headlines and how he said that he would come into yeah. the locker room and it just stank like beer all the time <laughs> essentially Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. There's no way that stuff would fly today. Like really like no. and it wasn't that long ago if you think about it, you know? Um No. So like and, and this is what uh something that I find annoying and I just wish this narrative like would go away is that a lot of people will say like you know, when they compare players from different eras against each other. They will say, I'm not going to, I won't even mention names. This is, I'm not thinking of a good example off the top of my head, but like the current player is way better than the X player from 40, 50 years ago because this player now has better nutrition, better sports science, better coaching. I'm like, yeah, that's true, but you can't punish that player in that previous era for that because if that player was came up in this era, he would be just as dominant because he would have the same advantages. So they're ahead of their time for a reason. Like this is something that they say about Alfredo Di Stefano. They look at him. He's like this balding guy who's just ripping through defenses in the black and white video. Like this guy literally was the Michael Jordan of his time. He was unreal. The mentality he had, the competitiveness, he kept himself in shape. Ferenc Puskas is another good example, Adrian, because he was like overweight and he was yeah. smoking when he was 32 and scoring 50 goals a year. They're like, well, he can't do that now. Like, well, now he would probably be in better shape and would adapt and sc still score, you know, a sick amount of goals. So uh, just something that I, that I thought of. Um, here's, I guess, to put a bow on this podcast, I wanted to ask you a few questions. Where is the channel going? Where is it headed? Do you have any plans for it to like take it to the next level? Like, I mean, you already have like over 250,000 subscribers, so you're well on your way right now, but what's next for the channel? So the next thing that I want to work on, it's uh, and I'm sort of moving in this direction, is I want to start shooting documentaries instead of just doing these videos where I'm sitting in my in here with my fake plant. I want to actually go sort of boots on the ground kind of thing, actually film these documentaries. Like if I do a Roots of the Rivalry, for example, I want to go to Lisbon and sort of interview people and speak to people about the foundation of Benfica versus the foundation of sporting and why that rivalry has continued to grow and grow and grow and various points where there was flashpoints that it got inflamed, etc. So that's the next step that I want to take. Um, and then aside from that, I have been recently in this sort of 
inflection point kind of thing where I'm starting to think of like, okay, I've been doing all these things fine. What else can I do? And how can I sort of use what I'm good at, which is like the history side of things and create new series. So I have one that's going to be coming out towards the end of March um, that if that video does well, I'll turn that into a series. Um, and then, yeah, but I would say the main focus has been trying to actually shoot documentaries uh, for the future, sort of like, I don't want to say like Copa 90 back in the day, but I guess they were sort of the pioneers of it on YouTube, at least um, those kinds of sort of shot documentaries where you're actually there and you're seeing it and experiencing it and not just like a look, I love a match day vlog. Those are fine, but not just like a me walking into a stadium with my cell phone kind of thing, more of a full on package that production. Yeah, exactly. That would not be far. Well, it will be my first documentary, so I'm not going to say anything, but it was something that would look more like you would see on a streaming service rather than just a YouTube vlog kind of thing. Got it. What's your timeline on something like that? I would say the next year, essentially. Okay. Yeah, I would say the next year or so. Awesome. Well, we'll yeah. look forward to that. Um, one quick super chat came in. Sanji Da says Madrid City will be the same as Inter Barca 2010. So let me think. Barca Inter 2010. Epic so two I, games. Yeah. So City is Barca in this case, I guess. Probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, look, that's a tough. I mean, you guys must be getting sick of seeing each other at this point, but I mean, you have to face each other at some point, you know, when you're yeah. the elite clubs in the competition. Um, that's a really tough one. That's one of those games where I would say right now it's it's fair to say that neither club is at like the tip top form that they would want to be in in this moment. But then you look at their unbeaten runs and how many matches they've actually lost this season, and it's like trying to find gaps in the armor where it's really difficult to do so. Um, how are you feeling about this one? Uh, this season? Uh, the same as I felt last season, which was delusionally optimistic. <laughs> so like, Fair. and I've, I've said this before, cause I was at the Etihad for that four nil last year. Okay. And at halftime we were getting just played off the park. And I was like, we got this, we got this. And obviously <laughs> like we didn't at all. Um, I guess the biggest question is like, did we learn from the mistakes of last season? Hmm. Did we, did we learn? And I guess that remains to be seen. And also, how are we going to deal with the Etihad? Because it was a, just a complete beast for us two years in a row. Mm -hmm. We lost four three two years ago, but it should have been way more than just the one goal margin. And then last year, it was it's been tough for us. At the Burnaby, we're a bit better, but at the Etihad, we need to figure that out. Yeah, I hear you. I. Uh... It's this thing where like you can never count out Real Madrid. Um, but I was trying to look at what's up with Manchester City recently. And I found that I really had to dig deep. Their expected goals against is a little bit higher this season than last season. And then yeah. obviously, because I was trying to figure out like they don't seem as potent as they were at this point last season. I think at this point yes. last season, everyone was looking at them as the favorites to win everything. This season, it's like they're still really good, but something's a little bit off. And it's those expected goals against is a little bit higher. So they're giving up more opportunities in this moment. And then on top of that, you also have Erling Haaland, who is actually underperforming his XG in both the Premier League and the Champions League right now. Mm -hmm. and those two minor differences, I think, are all that sort of is different from Manchester City in this moment. So if you guys are clinical against them, great. But again, it's at that what we were talking about earlier where the players make the difference, you know, like on the day when you get to this level, the elite players are going to make that difference. And if Kevin De Bruyne plays out of his mind, if Erling Haaland finds this, if, 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 if it can be just as difficult as last season. I, I think Grealish is back are going to be back. Close to, to yeah. Pep, close to, yeah. yeah. I think that would also make a difference too, because uh, he gave us a lot of problems last season. And I don't know what his, his, fitness levels are going to be heading into those two games. I assume he'll be back for the second leg for sure. And first half, our first game might be a little bit more uh, rushed. I'm not sure. Did you, have you gone through like, and done a Champions League bracket? Like from here on in, do you have predictions lined up? Yeah, that video is going to, I'm going on vacation soon. So that video is going to be out on the 28th, but I have sort of, I don't mind sort of speaking about it, but. Um, give us just a, like one spoiler. You don't have to give sure. us the whole thing. Yeah. So I did, uh, I have PSG beating Barcelona. Okay. I do have that. I, I think that Barcelona is a weird team right now where they have looked good and I have like changes that have occurred in their attack 
with Lewandowski, with Yamal, even Rafinha playing in that half space on the left against Napoli, I did like. But then I was looking at the matches they have won, and it's, you know, it's 4 0 against Hitafe. It's, yeah. it's Atletico Madrid, where you look at Simeone's record against Barcelona, it's just Terrible. hilarious. Um, and it's against a Napoli side that's on their fourth manager in a year. So positives for sure, but haven't really been tested that much as well. So I think that just with that Mbappe factor and Enrique as well, I think that uh, PSG is going to overcome Barcelona. You can't uh, you can't discount also the Dembele revenge tour. That's true. That's true. I Good forgot job. about that guy. He's Maybe been a little... even Asensio off the bench. I don't know. I don't know. Can't get our hopes up with that, but you know, it could be a bonus. Um, awesome. Adrian, thanks so much for lending a bit of your time on this podcast. I really appreciate it. It goes without saying, and I probably don't need to say it because you have a huge channel and everyone knows, but just in case there's a 1% chance that someone here doesn't know about you, uh, Rabona TV on YouTube, Twitter, I think all the social media, Instagram, it's also yeah. there scrolling on the bottom of the video. Please go in and follow Adrian's work. Um, any concluding thoughts, my man? Thank you for having me on. This was a lot of fun. And uh, best of luck in the Champions League. I'll be watching very, very closely. Thank you so much, man. I'll have to have you on the channel soon as well. Next Real Madrid video I'm doing, you're up. Anytime, man. Anytime. Would love to. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you to Adrian for lending time on this podcast and spending some time with us. Thank you to our listeners, those who submitted questions, those who are watching. If you joined late, this whole thing will be posted wherever you get your podcasts um, in its entirety. Thanks, guys. Take care. Peace out.